Nothing changed, maybe the logo changed. The uh, relationship status changed maybe. That's it, nothing changed. The life is the same, no new ideas, no innovations, no development of any kind. And it's very sad because there's so much to live for. The, the, the mind that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you, the neshama that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you is capable of doing wonders. You can do so much that it's truly unbelievable that the, when a person wastes it purely just for commerce purposes, purely just for physical pleasures, it's literally like murdering yourself. Because yes, we all need to do some business to make a living and we all need to fulfill certain desires, eating, drinking, procreating, and so on and so forth. But if that's the only purpose a person lives for, it becomes a purposeless life that you can fast forward 20 years, hairdo will change maybe, maybe not, clothes will change maybe, maybe not, for sure they're gonna get fatter because we all do. Other than that, nothing. You can continue the conversation that you stopped 20 years ago, as if nothing has changed because nothing has. So when a person that learns Torah and makes an effort to learn Torah every single day, and it doesn't need to be 20 hours a day or 15 hours a day or something that is you know, not feasible in the mind of a person when they first start. It could literally be an hour or two a day, but an hour or two of serious learning that is actually going to change their life. A person that learns in that fashion turns the entire day, the entire 24 hours revolves around that one or two hours that they learn. That whole 24 hours exists just for that one or two hours. Why? Because that's when I'm alive. That's when I'm alive. Now, I can tell you all of this, but I can't make you feel any of it. Doesn't matter how many words I use, I can talk for another thousand hours. I can never make you feel it. I can never make you feel what it feels like to learn for several hours straight. I can never make you feel what it feels like to learn for several hours straight, multiple days in a row. And I can never make you feel like what it feels like to learn every single day for several months in a row and apply those changes to your life. In fact, the greatest pleasure that a person could ever have, whether it be drugs or, or any other physical desire, if you combine all of them, would not be equivalent to even a single minute of the feeling that a person gets after they start applying Torah to their life, but not initially, after it becomes a permanent fixture in their life. Now, when you tell this to an average person that has no concept, it's not going to help them. So if you're going to try to change yourself with this, it may work sometimes, it may not work sometimes. If you're going to try to convince your old friends that are trying to bring you back to the back in the day, to being a criminal again, to being a gangster again, and it doesn't need to be gangster against the police, it could just be a gangster against God, usually it's not going to work. Why? I need to see it. Thank you very much for speaking for an hour. I need to see any of this. I can't see any of this. I could, you know, maybe funny a little bit, but I can't see any of it. But you know what everybody can see? You know what everybody can feel? Suffering. That's something that is universal in every language. Everyone is afraid of suffering. Everyone has their life revolved around the fear of suffering in one form or another. They go into relationships because they suffer from loneliness or they're afraid to suffer from loneliness. They make certain business transactions because they're either suffering from poverty or they're afraid to suffer from poverty. They do all types of things because they're afraid to, that they're going to be missing in action. And suffering, whether it exists or it's simply in a person's mind, is the primary driving force for why people make their decisions in life. Hence the reason why I can speak out of my office, give a lecture for two hours and help thousands of people do tshuva. Other people can do the same exact thing in a hall with 5,000 people for 20 years straight. And not a single person will change. Because one person is telling people what they can connect to, the other person is just pacifying them. Everyone is afraid to suffer. But what happened is, Abutai, the Yetzirah is so clever, he's so smart, 
He convinced everyone, as I said earlier, that the suffering is minute. The suffering is limited. What? Gehenna? No, I don't think he understood it. It's only a Midrash. It's only a Gemara. And you know, there are other opinions. And the Yetzirah tried to make sure that everybody just doesn't even think about the 13 principles of faith, of how punishment is actually something you're obligated to think about every single day. And in fact, when you actually understand the words you're saying in prayer, in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, what you read in every parasha, what you read in every sidu, what you read in every holiday, what is literally across all spectrums of our holy Torah, you're constantly reminded of the consequences. In the morning, in the morning shachit, for anyone that's gonna attend synagogue in the morning, you may have not noticed it, but you will notice it tomorrow. Where in the morning prayer it says, Az panim le The arrogant, they go to Geinom. Why? Because if they're arrogant, that means they're not gonna change. If they're not gonna change, certainly they're not gonna do Hashem's will. Yeah, but if he's still coming to shul, is not good enough? No. If he's coming to shul and still arrogant, he's actually much worse off than the guy who didn't come to shul because at least before he came to shul, there was hope that if he came to shul and came to the shul and came to tshuva, he would change. If he's going to shul and he's still arrogant, we have a very serious problem. And that's good morning. Good morning. Already in the morning, you just woke up, you still have a little cobwebs on your eyes and it, Chachamim said, already you have to know, Geinom is right next to you. And it mentions it countless times in the prayer. But yet, anytime we've mentioned it in Shi'urim, anytime somebody has asked their local rabbi, unless that local rabbi was a serious Talmud Chacham, that had Yirat Shemaim, they would do whatever they could to cool the people off. Because when a person has Yirat Shemaim, that means that instead of being on autopilot, working for the Yetzirah, making sins, when a person has Yirat Shemaim, when a person has fear of the Almighty, they go on autopilot of doing what Hashem says. One of my dear students told me that one of the ways that he tries to steal time from the Yetzirah so he can learn more Torah, he's a very big matmid, works a full-time career, does Kiruv, and he learns seven to nine hours a day. I have some people that I know that if they learn two hours a day, it would already be a miracle. This guy learns seven to nine hours a day with a full-time career, works for two companies and does Kiruv. Something unbelievable. One of the ways that he does it is he steals time from the Yetzirah wherever he can. As a, I'll show me an example. He said, I bought a car, it's called a Tesla. I said, okay, Tesla studies for you. He goes, no, no, it drives for me. So what do you mean drives for you? He says, he drives for you. You just go into the car and it drives wherever you want it to go. You just put it in the computer and it drives. So I said, what do you do when it drives? Because I read, I learned a lot. He genius. Tesla exists just for this guy. Literally, you have a trillion dollar company. However much it's worth today, it's just for this guy. There is no other reason for this company to exist. What, do you think a Kadosh Baruch Hu really cares if people drive or don't drive, if people are going to, you know, fill up their gas from something that he created from, the, from his own nature, or are they going to fill up from a different part of his nature? Like, isn't, you think a Kadosh Baruch Hu cares about this or this? But to give a Jew an opportunity to learn for an extra 40 minutes a day, because he doesn't have to turn the wheel, that's worth it. It's worth it for a, per, for, for a Kadosh Baruch Hu to create a trillion dollar company just for this. What's the source? The Rambam. The Rambam brings it, he says that a Kadosh Baruch Hu loves his children so much that he will give some sheikh, some Arab, endless amount of money and a crazy desire to build a tower in the middle of the desert for no reason whatsoever, just because a few hundred years later, some righteous Jew is gonna walk by, he's gonna be hot, so he needs the sh shadow, he needs uh, you know, something to cool off. Oh, big tower over there, let me just stand over there for an hour and then leave. The building can exist for 400 years just for that Jew to be there for an hour. That's how much a Kadosh Baruch Hu values the righteous people, the righteous Jews. So it's not a chidush that Tesla exists for this guy. It's not a chidush. And surely I'm hoping, and I assume that Be'ezlat Hashem, there's other people that are smart like this. Not because of this company, but because they know they need to fight the Yetzirah for time. If you think that you're gonna have free time to learn, 
you haven't met the Yetzirah yet. If the Yetzirah is sending you rabbis to fool you, sending you friends to fool you, sending you all types of people to fool you, surely he's going to send you opportunities to take your time. The Yetzirah is even going to be willing to give you millions of dollars, make you as rich as you want to be, just so you don't learn Torah. Because when a person finishes their life in this world, they can't take the money with them. So the Yetzirah gets it back anyway. The mitzvot, they can't take with them. And when a person doesn't learn Torah, they have no mitzvot. I wake up early in the morning to the words of Torah. Thank you, Akadosh Baruch Hu. In the minute that I wake up, I already know it's you.